Good day everyone and good day also to you, Mr. Karlovic B. Ibaok, our very active instructor in this subject, G6 Ethics. So for today's video, I am going to report my semi-final topic, Chapter 5, about Virtual Ethics. By the way, this is Angel Rose Esmeralda speaking and my task for today is to tackle about Virtue Ethics. Without further ado, let's begin. And now, let us all learn the concept about Virtue Ethics. Children at a young age have not yet achieved full personal growth and mental development. This situation makes them particularly vulnerable to possible and desirable effects of saying violent images presented on television. When they see violence on television on a regular basis, they may consider such violent acts as normal and part of the daily occurrences in life. Much worse is that they might tend to believe that such acts sins committed by adults are permissible. In these situations, the saying life imitates art unfortunately becomes uncomfortable true. There have been numerous studies on the effects of television violence on children. The American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, for instance, enumerated the harmful effects of television violence such as being insensitive to the possible ill consequences brought about by watching violent shows. The study also suggests that children exposed to television violence begin to imitate what they observe and consider violence as a way to solve problems. So, what do you mean by mature individuals? So, mature individuals are aware that it is vital for children to go through the process of building their personality, identity, or character. How does the continuous exposure to violence on television affect the character the children develop? Is it possible that Constant watching of violence on television results in aggression among children. What is the role of the child's environment in her capacity to develop into a good individual? So these questions are real concerns that society needs to address. Perhaps it is the best to look closely at how good moral character is developed among individuals. What elements are involved in order to achieve this? So one theory that can possibly provide a comprehensive understanding of how an individual can develop moral character is virtue ethics. So what is virtue ethics? Virtue ethics is the ethical framework that is concerned with understanding the good as a matter of developing the virtuous character of a person. Previous characters emphasize different aspects of ethics, consequences of an act of utilitarianism, natural inclinations for natural law, and autonomy for deontology. Virtue ethics, on the other hand, focuses on the formation of one's character brought about by determining and doing virtuous acts. So the two major thinkers of ancient Greece are Plato and Aristotle. So Aristotle's discourse of ethics departs from the Platonic understanding of reality and conception of the good. Both Plato and Aristotle affirm rationally 
as the highest faculty of a person and having such characteristic enables a person to realize the very purpose of her existence. But at the end, they differ in their appreciation of reality and nature, which in turn results in their contrasting stand on what the ethical principle should be. For Plato, the real is outside the realm of any human sensory experience, but can somehow be grasped by one's intellect. The truth and ultimately the good are in despair of forms or ideas transcending daily human condition. And now let's move on to happiness and ultimate purpose. Aristotle begins his discussion of ethics by showing that every act that a person does is directed toward a particular purpose, aim, or what the Greeks called telos. There is a purpose why one does something, and for Aristotle, a person's action manifests a good that she aspires for. Or, for Aristotle, the good is considered to be the telos or purpose for which all acts seek to achieve. Is it important for Aristotle that one becomes clear of the hierarchy of goals that different acts produce in order for a person to distinguish which actions are higher than the other? Okay, so for example, when one diligently writes down notes while listening to a lecture given by the teacher, she does this for the purpose of being able to remember the lessons of the course. This purpose of remembering in turn becomes an act to achieve a higher aim, which is to pass the examinations given by the teacher which then becomes a product that can help the person attain the goal of having a passing mark in the course. Is it important for Aristotle that one becomes clear of the hierarchy of goals that different acts produce in order for a person to distinguish which actions are higher than the other? Aristotle discusses the general criteria in order for one to recognize the highest good of man. So first, the highest good of a person must be final. As a final end, it is no longer utilized for the sake of arriving at this much higher end. In our example above, the purpose of remembering the lessons in the course that is why one writes down notes is not the final end because it is clear that such purpose is aimed at achieving a much higher goal. Second, the ultimate telos of a person must be self-sufficient. Satisfaction in life is arrived at once the highest good is attained. Nothing else is sought after and decide once the self-sufficient goal is achieved, since this is already considered as the best possible good in life. Again, in the example given, the goal of remembering the lessons in the course is not yet the best possible good because a person can still seek for other more satisfying goals in her life. So I have here a sample question. So what is the highest goal for Aristotle? What goal is both final and sufficient? According to Aristotle, older individuals would agree that the highest purpose and ultimate good of man is happiness, or for the Greeks, eudaimonia. So next, happiness. 
happiness for Aristotle is the only self-sufficient aim that one can aspire for. No amount of wealth or power can be more fulfilling than having achieved the condition of happiness. One can imagine a life of being wealthy, powerful, and experiencing pleasurable feelings and yet, such life is still not satisfying without happiness. Once happiness is achieved, things such as wealth, power, and pleasurable feelings just give value-added benefits in life. The true measure of well-being for Aristotle is not by means of richness or fame, but by the condition of having attained a happy life. So even though older individuals agree that happiness is the highest end and good that humans aspire for, but there are various opinions on what specifically in the nature of the ultimate telos of a person. One is that happiness is attached with having wealth and power. Others associate happiness with feelings that are pleasurable. Some take nobler things like honor and other ideals as constitute of happiness. For Aristotle, arguing for against every opinion proves to be a futile attempt to arrive at the nature of happiness. Instead, Aristotle shows that one can arrive at the ultimate good by doing one's function well. So, how does a person arrive at her highest good? According to Aristotle, if an individual's action can achieve the highest good, then one must investigate how she functions which enables her to achieve her ultimate purpose. If she perform her function well, then she is capable of arriving at happiness. Aristotle then proceeds with discussing the function of human beings to distinguish one person's activity from other beings. How does a human being function which sets her apart from the rest? For Aristotle, what defines human beings is her function or activity of reason. This function makes her different from the rest of beings Aristotle expresses this clearly. What defines a person, therefore, is her function or activity of reason. A person's action to be considered a truly human must be an act that is always accordance to reason. Any person for the matter utilizes her reason, but Aristotle further says that a person cannot only perform her function, but she can also perform it well. The local saying, madaling maging tao o mahirap magpakatao can be understood in the light of Aristotle's thoughts on the function of a good person. Because any human being can perform the activity of reason, thus being human is achievable. However, a good human being strives hard in doing activity in an excellent way. Therefore, the task of being human becomes more difficult because doing such activity will take more effort in the parts of the person. Okay, let's move on to virtue as excellence. Achieving the highest purpose of a human person concerns the ability to function according to reason and to perform an activity well or excellently. This excellent way of doing things is called virtue or aret by the Greeks. Aristotle is quick to add that virtue is something that one strives for in time. 
One does not become an excellent person overnight. For one swallow does not make a summer, nor does one day, and so to one day, or a short time, does not make a man blessed and happy. This means that being virtuous cannot be accomplished by a single act. It is commendable if a minor participant in a crime becomes a whistleblower, exposing all the grave acts that committed by his cohorts. But one should be careful in judgment of calling immediately that individual as being a person of virtue. Being an excellent individual works on doing well in her day-to-day -day existence. What exactly makes a human being ex excellent? Aristotle says that excellence is an activity of the human soul and therefore one needs to understand the very structure of a person's soul which must be directed by her rational activity in an excellent way. So the human soul is divided into two parts. And what is this? The irrational element and the rational faculty. So the irrational element of man consists of the vegetative and appetitive aspects. The vegetative aspects function as giving nutrition and providing the activity of physical growth in a person. As an irrational element, this part of mind is not in the realm where virtue is exercised because, as the term suggests, it cannot be dictated by reason. The vegetative aspects of the soul follows the natural process involved in the physical activities and growth of a person, whereas the appetitive aspects works as a desiring faculty of man. Thus, this aspect belongs to the irrational part of the soul. Sexual impulse, for example, is so strong in a person that one tends to ignore reasonable demands to control such impulse. However, unlike the vegetative aspect, the desiring faculty of man can be subjected to reason. Okay, so the rational faculty of man exercises excellence in him. This faculty divided into two aspects, and what are these? Moral and intellectual. For what do you mean by moral? Moral which concerns the act of doing. And intellectual which concerns the act of knowing. Okay, so there are two ways by which one can attain intellectual excellence. And it is philosophic and the practical. So when we say the philosophic wisdom, it deals with attaining knowledge about the fundamental principles and truths. While the practical wisdom, it is an excellent in knowing the right conduct in carrying out a particular act. Although the condition of being excellent can be attained by a person through the intellectual aspect of the soul, this situation does not make her into a morally good individual. However, Aristotle suggests that although the rational functions of a person or moral and intellectual are distinct from each other, it is necessary for humans to attain the intellectual virtue of practical wisdom in order to accomplish a morally virtuous act. For Socrates, moral goodness is already within the realm of intellectual excellence. Knowing the good implies the ability to perform morally virtuous acts. For Aristotle, however, 
having intellectual excellence does not necessarily mean that one already has the capacity of doing the good. Knowing the good that needs to be done is different from doing the good that one needs to accomplish. Therefore, rationally, faculty of a person tells us that she is capable of achieving two kinds of virtue, moral and intellectual. In discussing moral virtue, Aristotle says that it is attained by means of habit. A morally virtuous man for Aristotle is someone who habitually determines the good and does not right actions. Moral virtue is acquired through habit. Being morally good is a process of getting used to doing the proper act. The same practice makes perfect can be applied to this aspect of a person. The same is true with moral virtue. A moral person habitually chooses the good and consistently does good deeds. It is in the constant act of choosing and doing the good that a person is able to form her character. It is through one's character that others know a person. Character then becomes the identification mark of the person. For instance, when one habitually acts to be courteous to others and regularly shows politeness in the way she relates to others. The Filipino term pag-uugali precisely reflects the meaning of moral character. One can have mabuting pag-uugali or good character or masamang pag-uugali in English, bad character. Okay, let's move on to the moral virtue and mesotes. So, Brother Armin Luistro, he says that good values instilled on children are sometimes removed from the consciousness of young people because of television violence. However, when practical wisdom guides the conduct of making morally right choices and actions, what does it identify as the proper and right thing to do? As maintained by Aristotle, it is the middle, intermediate, or mesotest for the Greeks that is aimed at by a morally virtuous person. Determining the metal becomes the proper tool by which one can arrive at the proper way of doing things. Based on Aristotle, a morally virtuous person is concerned with achieving her appropriate action in a manner that is neither excessive nor deficient. In other words, virtue is the metal or the intermediary point in between extremes. Thus, the mesotest is constantly moving depending on the circumstance where she is in. Aristotle's discussion ultimately leads to defining what exactly moral virtue is. It is the state of character concerned with choice, lying in a mean, that is the mean relative to us, this being determined by a rational principle and by that principle by which the man of practical wisdom and would determine it. Okay, so again, what is moral virtue? Moral virtue is firstly the condition arrived at by a person who has a character identified out of her habitual exercise of particular actions. One's character seen as a growth in terms of the continuous preference for the good. Secondly, in moral virtue, the action then that nor normally manifests feelings and passions is chosen because it is the middle. Aristotle adds that the middle is relative to us. This is, does not imply that mesotis totally depends on what the person identifies as the middle.
The rational faculties of this person, specifically practical wisdom, aid in making a virtuous person develop the habits of doing the good. A moral person in this sense is also someone who is wise. Habit is not born out of repetitive and not thought of activities on a person. Habits for Aristotle are products of the constant application of reason in the person's actions. One sees Aristotle attempt to establish a union between the person's moral action and knowledge that enables him to achieve man's function. Aristotle clarifies further that not all feelings, passions, and actions have middle point. However, when what is involved in seem as a bad feeling, passion, or action, the middle is non-existent because there is no good in something that is already considered a bad act. When one murders someone, there is nothing excessive or deficient in the act. Murder is still murder. Further, there is no intermediary for Aristotle in the act because there is no proper way that such act can be committed, Aristotle states. In the study mentioned wherein children are beginning to consider violence as a way to solve problems, it seems apparent that they would like to think that there is somehow a good in an unjust act since it can become a problem solver. If violence becomes a tool by which difficult situations are addressed, then it can be continued continued by children of bearing some positive value. Okay, so Aristotle also provides examples of particular virtues and the corresponding exists and deficiencies of this. So this table shows some of the virtues and their vices. It includes exists, middle, and the deficiency exists includes impulsiveness recklessness and the prodigality while in the middle self-control the courage and liberality and the last in the deficiency indecisiveness cowardice and meanness in this table aristotle identifies the virtue of courage as the middle in between the vices of being coward and reckless. Cowardice is the deficiency in terms of feelings and passions. This means that one lacks the capacity to muster enough bravery of carrying herself appropriately in a given situation. Recklessness, on the other hand, is an excess in terms of one's feelings and passions. In this regard, one acts with a surplus of guts that she overdoes and act in such rashness and without any deliberation. The virtue of having courage is being able to act directly enough but able to wake up possible implication of such act that she proceeds with caution. It is only true in the middle that the person is able to manifest her feelings, passions, and actions virtuously. For Aristotle being superfluous with regard to manifesting a virtue is no longer an ethical act because one has gone beyond the middle. Being overly courageous for super courageous, for instance, does not make someone more virtuous because precisely in this condition, she has gone beyond the middle and therefore has moved out from the state that is virtuous. Therefore, one can always be excessive in her action, but an act that in 
that is virtuous cannot go beyond the middle. Filipinos have the penchant of using superlative words like over, super, to the max, and sobra. In describing a particular act that they normally identify as virtuous, perhaps Aristotle views on virtue is prescribing a clearer way by which Filipinos can better understand it.